going to get started in just a few minutes. Oh, your recording is starting now. That's too soon. Okay, I'll try to keep it on the up and up then. Um, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Our guest, Diane Williams, is here today. Let's see. I'm even getting my screen set up for you all too. Uh, Vivian, you should go ahead and put that note in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's see. Oh, we can see Annika. Hi, Annika. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Pam. Hi, Vivian. Okay. All right. Well, it's 2.31, so I will get started. My name is Pamela Lewis. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of the art gallery here at College of the Canyons. And I welcome you here today. Um, the art gallery at COC um, has two spaces on our campus, one in Mintry Hall and Gallery 206 in the library. And um, our artist today has work on view here on site in Gallery 206. So if you have not yet um, been up to see the show, I sure hope you will get a chance to do that. We present um, here in our galleries, we present generally um, three, four, five professional exhibitions a year in addition to student projects and student exhibitions. Um, and so we were thrilled. We had virtual exhibitions last year when we were all remote. So we're really thrilled to have artists um, in our spaces this year and um, to have Diane Williams with us today. I'm gonna give a little introduction to Diane now. Um, so, uh, Diane Williams is an interdisciplinary artist, researcher, and organizer based in LA. I, uh, was able to see, uh, her work virtually online at big exhibition that she did for her master's, uh, culmination of her master's degree at USC. Um, let's see, the Mess of Empire is in Gallery 206, as I mentioned, um, and it will be until December 9th. So again, I hope you'll go see it. Um, in addition to getting her um, MFA from USC, she got her BFA um, from Cal State Long Beach and has exhibited widely um, in California and has had much coverage of her work in such publication as Art Forum and Hyperallergenic, where you, um, that's an artillery, LA Weekly, LA Magazine, Art and Cake. Which one were you on the cover? Um, I realized that I had seen you on the, your work on the cover of one of those magazines a while back too, when I was looking through your bio. Which one was that with the nice? Uh, it, was, uh, it was on artillery. That was artillery, yeah. 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 Um, and let's see, her work examines colonial legacies and the afterlives of empires. Um, and Diane, I'm gonna let you talk about all of those things um, and all of the metaphors, all of the stories and the sort of important action that your work encompasses. So if you'd all help me in welcoming Diane Williams. Yeah, thank you so much for that really nice introduction, Pam. And thank you all so much for being here. Um, you know, it's um, this is one of the most difficult times in our lives right now. And so I commend you all for being in school right now. So give yourselves a pat in, pat in the back. You all deserve it. And, you know, continue, you know, from here on out. Um, I also have roots in community college, um, which is um, at my foundation before I went to um, Cal State Long Beach for uh, my undergrad and then um, the subsequently uh, getting my MFA degree at uh, USC. Um, yeah, and so should I um, share my screen now or? 
Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. So Diane's going to present her work as she talks so that we have um, images to look at for those of you who have not seen her work, or even if you have, it's very helpful. So yeah, sure, Diane, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and we will get started. All right, can you all see this? I got it, yeah, I see it there. Okay, so um, the, well, the, the show is called The Mess of Empire, and um, like what Cam was saying, if you haven't already done so, it's at Gallery 206. Um, the work is actually better seen in person because it's so uh, detailed. Um, but, you know, I'm gonna be um, presenting uh, the best photos I have. Um, so uh, before I um, before I present uh, the work, um, let me give you a little bit of uh, background about myself um, because I'm going to be talking about um, the current body of uh, my current body of work. Um, and um, I immigrated to the United States from the Philippines when I was 15 years old. Um, if you don't know where the Philippines is, it, it is an archipelago in uh, Southeast Asia, which comprises three uh, main islands, the Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Um, but it has over 7,000 islands and uh, only 2,000 of which are inhabited. Um, it was colonized by Spain, um, the United States, and briefly by Japan. Uh, which which um, spans a total of about 400 years of colonization. So that's a really long time to uh, be under foreign rule. And so I'm using uh, my background or this background as a point of departure for um, uh, for my work, for you know both my research and also uh, the visual artwork. And so my current body of work is and it actually draws from uh, my thesis. Um, at the University of Southern California. Um, and it examines colonial legacies at, uh, as it relates to uh, my background and also the Philippines. Um, and so, I mean, we hear these terms colonial legacies all the time. And so what does that really mean? And so, I mean, legacy, legacies just mean influences or outcomes. Um, and we all know also that legacies are passed from one generation to the next. And they're also embedded in our culture um, from our own you know, perceptions about life and our lived conditions. And so why are we still talking about colonization, right? So colonialism happened um, a while ago. And so uh, we're still talking about this because, um, you know, like I said, it is passed from one generation to the next and it's also um, embedded in our culture. And so it is still relevant today. Um, and these forms of colonial legacies um, are internalized oppression, um, which, you know, which means self-hate. It could be in the form of feeling inferior or not feeling uh, good enough. Uh, erasure of indigeneity, which I'm going to cover um, when I, you know, when I'm showing you my when I show you my work, or the certain pieces that actually uh, that actually cover that hybridity, which is um, you know, the syncretic cultures, um, invisibility, lack of representation, racism, income inequalities, and so on. I mean, there's a lot, um, uh, but I'm only gonna cover a few of them because, you know, as you can already tell, these are really, really, really complex subjects. Um, and also really relevant to our time and our uh, discussions across uh, cultural across cultures, across mm -hmm. everything right now. I mean, one thing that I'm struck by already, and I know it'll become clear as you keep talking, because I love hearing what you have to say about your work in general, but is, you know, thinking of you as like a 15 year old coming to the US, how, you know, how did you, and you can address this as we look at, you know, as you do, as you have planned, but just coming up with the language to like recognize, I think one of the biggest challenges um, can be sort of recognizing the sort of 
apparatuses that are in place that might be sort of naming you as other or outside, right? Um, but just being able to articulate what you've already said um, seems such a challenge. Like, how did you first start finding language for these big uh, cultural ideas? You know, maybe you had a felt experience, but how did you start articulating it and finding the language to talk about it? Yeah, well, the research didn't really come through until grad school, um, you know, because undergrad, that is um, when you learn your techniques, your skill sets, um, and you learn a little bit of art history. But the critical theory is, is not a big part of that in undergrad. Um, and so when you go to grad school, this is when you really develop your context. Um, you know, I mean, of course, I had a little bit of understanding of, of colonialism, um, being, you know, born in the in the Philippines. Um, you know, colonialism was was um, was big, but um, it's but racism, on the other hand, um, is a little bit different, um, it, and it's not a big issue there because it's you know it's mostly uh, homogenized. And um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't really until grad school, you know, when I started the research war. Um, this is the big bulk of, um, you know, of how I came about with the context and with the language uh, as well. Um, and the work that you're seeing right now, this exhibit was my thesis show at USC. Um, yeah, and so as a visual artist, um, I'm always thinking about uh, visual strategies. So how do I convey what my research is or what I'm trying to do with my research? And um, I'm asking questions about like, how do I create a dialogue about these concepts, uh, about these really, really complex concepts or subjects? And so this prompted me to um, to, re to do research um, about an object, uh, which is called the parol. Uh, the parol is actually really, um, really popular in the Philippines. Every single Filipino household I know has one. I have one, my family, <laughs> my, fam my whole family does. Um, and it, it is an ornamental star-shaped Christmas lantern, uh, which is believed to have originated from uh, the Spanish colonial era. Um, but because of, because of the word parol, um, you know, which is a Spanish word, uh, parol, uh, which means lantern, but there is no F in the Filipino language, um, which is why um, the F became a P. Um, but the true lineage of this object um, is kind of murky. And so it's, it's, it's unclear, uh, which is, again, one of the colonial legacies, which is the erasure of indigeneity. Um, it is really difficult to find some written history about, um, about pre-colonial history in the Philippines because um, it doesn't exist in the archives. And so if you research um, the parol in, you know, at a big, um, uh, university like, you know, like USC or a library, it really doesn't exist. And so um, I had to resort to the internet, <laughs> you know, mostly from travel websites and they link the parole to, to Spain. Um, and also some of the, um, some of the accounts or the stories, um, you know, say it comes from Mexico and some say it comes from China. Um, and of course, the, uh, the Filipinos want to uh, claim it as their own, um, as a native object. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so in my work, um, I weave a lot of different um, multimedia uh, materials in there. And um, most of it um, is actually donated. Um, by family and friends. Um, and so I don't really, you know, I'm more interested in, in, in the history of these objects or these materials that I'm, um, that I'm accumulating 
And um, to me, although they are unwanted items, these things have history. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm sort of uh, creating an archive or, um, you know, or a visual, uh, you know, archive of uh, the narratives and histories of my community here in Los Angeles and also in the Philippines. And so I'm weaving, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of Filipino food wrappers in there, yarn, um, fabric, um, spam cans, even uh, plastic bags from my immigrant markets and crochet flowers, food containers, my mother's all dresses and, and so on. Um, and so this particular uh, piece is, uh, is called Roadside Memorial. And I've always been really fascinated by roadside memorials uh, because it kind of like, again, like people leave um, these items um, that, you know, that have symbolic meaning to them, but to onlookers, they are, you know, they're just merely trash, you know, and, and detritus. And so to me, I became really interested in that concept of what is, what is trash or what is unwanted or what is disposable and what has, you know, what has history, what has significant, uh, you know, cultural significance. Um, and so in a way, what I'm doing with this is um, weaving, you know, all of these things together, kind of like a roadside memorial, um, you know, which we kind of, um, you know, we had uh, Dia de los Muertos, um, just a few days ago. Uh, and in the Philippines, we kind of have uh, a similar day, which is all souls day, uh, which is um, uh, based on uh, Catholicism. Um, and what we do is we celebrate the souls of the dead, um, which, you, you know, kind of is irrelevant with uh, what I'm doing here with this piece. Um, and I'm also doing a lot of collaging collaging these materials, putting them together um, and, you know, layering them. And um, also what I want my viewers to do is ask questions about what the relationship to, um, what is the relationship to the puddle, you know, uh, when you're looking at, you know, items that are seemingly like trash. Um, you know, and so as artists, we kind of, you know, want to create these conversations, um, you know, and you're not, even if you don't get it right away, it's okay to, you know, it's okay to just ask questions about the work. And really that's, that's what we can hope for. Um, and so what I'm doing here is I'm superimposing um, the deconstructed uh, image of the battle, um, which you will see again and again uh, with the work. Um, these are huge, by the way, and, you know, as you can see, they extend to the floor. Yeah, I love, I love the big scale of so many of the works, and then there's so much intricate detail within, and how you're sort of exploiting and utilizing these metaphors of sort of weaving, quilting, patching together these stories that kind of, and as you're saying, like it's a memorial, there is a sense of loss, but there's also this sort of exuberant presence, you know, the color, the texture, I mean, you know, you can't stop looking at them. And, um, and that's an interesting balance visually, like you're immediately for our space in gallery 206, you're immediately drawn in, you want to see it, you want to touch it, which you don't do. <laughs> you you want to walk around it. You're, it envelops and changes the space, but it is put together by mm -hmm. all these tiny parts, these, you know, things that are no longer needed, things that have been disposed of, but also things with a lot of nostalgia, like you and I talked about, you know, the spam cans when I saw them in your studio, you know, because I have a very different background. My my family's from the south in the United States, but spam was a part of, you know, it was canned meat. You didn't need to refrigerate it. You could easily, it was movable, you know, and they were uh, itinerant workers. And so that was important. So you see these things and it reminds you of home. It makes you think of a past, but then it's also like you're saying, like the roadside to memorials, it's like 
okay, oh, that's intentional. You know, you come across these things and it's like, is that, wait, what am I looking at? And you realize, oh, this is an int intentional thing, but so much of it would it be something that, you know, someone not from that family, not from that culture, not from that neighborhood would have maybe disposed of or not thought to keep a memory in, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and thank you for saying that because, um, you know, the point of this um, of uh, this research is also about contending um, with these legacies and how do we reimagine, um, you know, these uh, these colonial legacies of the past, but they're still here. And so, how do we move on from there? And and spam is actually, you know, a good uh, metaphor for that because you know although spam is uh, is deeply uh, you know has has a deep uh, lineage to colonialism because home mail foods actually created this product um, in the late 1800s when the US started uh, colonizing um, countries like the Philippines um, and so what it was really intended for the soldiers because they wanted them to have nutrition, which, you know, spam nowadays, if you think about spam, it's like spam nutritional value, you know, they kind of don't go hand in hand, but, um, but yeah. And so the Americans were actually the ones who introduced spam to, uh, or the American soldiers were the ones who introduced spam to the Philippines and they, um, gave um, spam to the natives as a form of, you know, as a gift if they did them a favor, you know, and that kind of like um, introduced them to, to spam. And it is widely loved in, in the Philippines. And also, you know, it's the same with Hawaii also. And, and that's, the sim that's a similar um, story of why it is embraced in, um, in the Pacific as well or, you know, in the, the islands in the Pacific. Um, this is one of the ones that um, is exhibited at Gallery 206. It's called the Spanish Administrators. Um, I have always wondered why, um, you know, why Mexico and um, the Philippines have similar backgrounds. And, you know, even, I don't know if you can see, um, the serape here um, and, and this embroidery here. It's very similar to, um, to the Philippine embroidery and Philippine um, weaving. And it's because, you know, of course, that we have the same Spanish administrators, you know, for 300 years. And so um, they also did a lot of trading with, um, you know, from Mexico, uh, to the Philippines, and it's called the Galleon, uh, the Galleon trade, and um, and they traded, uh, they traded spices, uh, seeds, and a lot of different things, and they also traded people um, as indentured servants, and so there's a lot of influences there, um, and it actually took uh, at least four months to get from Mexico to the Philippines by uh, by boat. And so, um, you know, and so uh, the influences are there, um, but the reason why um, Mexicans um, speak Spanish and the Filipinos, um, you know, they don't speak full Spanish. Um, their words are, you know, are, some of the words are actually, a lot of the words are in Spanish uh, because it wasn't actually settled. By, by Spain, by the Spaniards. Uh, only about 2,000 people or 2,000 Spaniards um, were in the Philippines and they were, uh, you know, some, some settled there, but not, not very many. Um, and so for them, it was easier to, um, to go from Mexico to the Philippines because it would be treacherous to go the other way and it would take actually over a year um, to do that. Um, and so they used the, um, their colonized countries as stepping stones to go from one place to another. 
This is just incredible to look at. Can you tell us a little bit about the materials in this work? Yeah. Um, this, this um, you know, like I said, all of these uh, materials are actually from, um, they have history from, from other people. Um, and this um, um, veil here was actually my mom's veil that she wore um, when I was a kid. You know, she would go to, uh, she would go to church, you know, and, and <laughs> would wear this thing. And she actually, she actually hates seeing her items <laughs> in my artwork because, you know, she thinks it's like, oh, you're destroying my, you know, you're destroying my stuff. But I mean, I can kind of see that, but it's, you know, to me, it's actually um, doing more by, um, you know, by kind of like archiving all of these materials and telling stories about them. Um, Catholicism is actually another, um, another legacy, um, a colonial legacy. Um, and, you know, by the way, not all of colonial legacies are bad. Again, it's really like contending, you know, with, uh, with the fact that, you know, colonialism happened and, you know, we should be able to, um, to have conversations about really difficult uh, subjects because they happened, it is history. Um, and this piece is called the umbilical cord. And this is really more about, um, about the, uh, the immigrant experience and um, kind of like cutting or severing the umbilical cord um, from your motherland. Um, and so these, um, these uh, cotton well piping, I actually died in um, at Achuete, which is uh, Achiote in, in Mexico, which was actually traded um, you know, from Mexico to the Philippines. Um, and I like using natural dyes that have, uh, again, historical, um, uh, historical significance also. Um, but I'm not going to lie, the achiote took so long to, to take and it didn't really, um, it didn't really come up, come out, you know, with this um, red, um, um, with this red dye here. It was a little bit more orangey. Um, you know, it was still kind of reddish, but you know, it has that orange tint, which I just didn't like. Um, and so I put beets in there. <laughs> so I cheated a little bit. But again, it, it is um, within the same idea of you know weaving all of these um, you know cultural things together. And you know, what does it even mean? You know, to um, leave uh, serape in there or to leave, um, you know, plastic bags in there, plastic bags of, um, of immigrant uh, markets in Los Angeles. So it's kind of, again, it's, uh, it's really about um, archiving all of the histories of my community and also uh, my family and friends. Um, the Santo Nino story, again, um, has um, colonial, uh, colonial lineage. Um, Santo Nino is um, baby Jesus. And so I've always wondered when I was a kid, um, I've always wondered why every single uh, Filipino household has the statue of the Santo Nino. And every culture has a different version of the baby Jesus. Um, and this one particular um, baby Jesus um, in the Philippines um, is has a red cloak with um with gold uh, embroidery which is kind of reminiscent of you know of this the red and the gold um i kind of like with my work i tend not to be too um too direct you know or too literal but i'm infusing things in there that would remind you of what i'm actually um what i'm actually uh working with um, and again, I dyed this with the same achiote and cheated a little bit with the beets uh, because it wasn't coming out, you know, uh, red enough. Um, so the Santo Nino, the baby Jesus, uh, actually has, you know, like I said, uh, 
colonial uh, lineage, um, Ferdinand Magellan, who, who was a Portuguese um, explorer, um, he discovered, and I'm using air quotes uh, because people were already there, he discovered the Philippines in 1521. Um, and uh, so he was a, a Portuguese explorer, but led, um, led the Spanish uh, expedition. Uh, that started in 1519. So in 1521, he actually landed um, the Philippines um, and met uh, the chief of Mactan, um, which is an island in, in the Philippines in Cebu. Um, and um, he befriended this chief uh, named Raja Humabon, um, who he baptized, renamed, he renamed um, his tribe as well, um, and along with his wife, um, and he um, he gifted the Santo Niño to the tribe, to this uh, to this uh, chief. Um, so Magellan was actually uh, was actually killed in the Philippines um, during that time in 1520. And this is also in, um, in gallery 206. Um, it's called My Mother's Daster, uh, which is a daster is just a, um, a Filipino version of the uh, Western duster, which is a, um, it's a, it's a working dress uh, or a smock, um, you know, for women to do housework in. Um, so it, this, uh, this object has historical significance um, and it also represents care, culture, as well as domesticity. And so what I wanted um, to do here uh, is, is kind of like show this dress as a symbol of labor for women as well as uh, its cultural representation. Because um, today, one of the highest or uh, largest, uh, one of the largest resources of income um, in the Philippines is through OFWs, which is overseas Filipino workers. And so um, most of these overseas workers are women and they do housework abroad um, to, you know, to care for other people's families. Uh, and, and these women already have families, but they're kind of forced to do that because it's their only way of uh, making a, a living and so this is kind of like my homage to this um you know these women um and thing and thing how are we doing the time <laughs> i know <laughs> so you're curious right you're doing fantastic and i love looking at that i like you say that piece mother your mother's daster mm -hmm. is actually here mm -hmm. and it's a two-sided piece so i hope if you're going to go up to 206 or if you've been up and you want to revisit after you hear Diane's fascinating uh, detail about her work. It's really powerful to see uh, in person and, um, and just the sort of layering of materials. There's this kind of combination of, you know, very sort of careful sort of stitching, but it also feels like I'm noticing, you know, the stand that you created to sort of suspend this flag or banner uh, kind of shape, right? Um, you know, the two legs are different. The materials are not precious materials, but some of the, you know, uh, materials that you're talking about or the stories you're sharing do feel more personal, more precious. And I'm just wondering about that balance. Like when you're choosing how, as an artist, you know, you've got the research around the payroll, you're putting together this, story, you're looking at these legacies and you're sort of filtering them through your own experience and your own family experience. Um, how do you make those material choices? Like what are you foregrounding by the materials that you choose and how you choose to display them? Because this could be flat on a wall, but it's not. Yeah, I'm actually working with um, a lot of tension, you know, and, and kind of um, like juxtaposing um, these hard and soft lines, um, stable and unstable. 
um, because when I'm thinking about these OFWs, um, you know, these women, there is such a precarity or uncertainties about their lives, um, you know, and, and a lot of that I'm showing with the, the delicate lines and also, you know, using, using the hard and the soft plastic and then this, um, you know, and then this, um, um, this fabric here that is so delicate, you know, and um, if you touch it, I hope you don't, <laughs> it might crumble. You know, and, and, and then there's actually a pin here. This is just pin. And so what I'm doing here is kind of like um, showing how delicate, you know, some things are and how, you know, precarious some of these lives are. Um, and, you know, when, and again, I'm, I'm playing with, um, with the stable versus unstable, you know, when, and I'm using, um, I'm using concrete and also, um, and also steel, because, you know, this is what they're doing is an actual, you know, is a job, you know, and, and what do you do when you have to, um, you know, when you have to uh, leave your family um, to provide for them, and it is an actual stable job, you know, for them, um, and so they kind of justify it as that. Um, it is, you know, it, it is, um, it is kind of sad to think about it, but then again, you know, we all do what we have to do to provide for our families, you know, and, and again, that's why I'm kind of like, you know, using, um, these, uh, different types of materials and, you know, and, and I'm carefully, um, thinking about, you know, what their symbolisms are, um, that, not all of it though has symbolism. Um, I, I am a trained painter. Um, and so, you know, I like to think formally about, about what I'm doing, you know, about, about what I'm working with. Um, so some are mostly about color, you know, like putting these, like what happens when I put this color against that color, you know, or what happens if I put that shape against that shape. So, I'm still, you know, although they are trash <laughs> or detritus, um, I am very careful with the way that I treat them. Oh. Not making them, not making them be more, you know, more precious, but also like being really delicate with these items. Uh, yeah, I find that really interesting. In one of our um, participant, one of our students here, Karen Zia has said, I find this cement giving it such an interesting detail from the softness of all the materials as a mother's nurturing and the hard cement that emphasizes the, emphasizes the hard labor. It really is beautiful. Also their strength. Um, I thought that was an interesting comment. And I do yeah. think, you know, when I was looking at these too, I was thinking of the sort of structural or infrastructure and then this sort of span that's kind of pieced together. And, you know, so much of, we have so many tools as artists. You have, you know, such training in painting and drawing and, you know, choosing these materials. Um, but all the things you do know formally as an artist, these other parts of your story as a creator do come through. I mean, the color um, and movement through is so powerful, but I love it that it's all being sort of all these tools are being uh, brought into service of um, these, these stories, trying to help us all sort of be able to visualize, participate, you know, understand these stories and, you know, relating to them. I mean, I feel like a lot of us can relate um, to your, the specific story that you're telling, maybe we come in different ways, but even the choice to make something by hand, like to do all those stitches um, in a time where you could do some sort of digital imagery, you know, which is another kind of labor, but that really does foreground to me just as a certain kinds of, not to minimize it, but as certain kinds of brush strokes suggest different kinds of expression, that kind of stitching and piecing and balancing also foregrounds a kind of hand labor, a kind of personal labor 
um, that I think is really important to the story. It really puts people in the story um, and the hand in, a store, in the story in a way that's even more specific than say the formalness of a brushstroke, which also suggests, right, a gesture or movement or a person. Um, anyway, I just, knowing that you're a painter and then the color and how it's utilized in these and that you do use paint and that you do cheat and you add the tools that you know are gonna, um, you know, it's a, it's a kind of visual poetry that really takes that, the formalism and is really engaging these stories in a way to, that's, I think, really wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, um, yeah and, and as a painter also, you know, Sam, as you know, we kind of like, uh, there is a way to make things slow and to, you know, to make things a lot faster, you know, with the brush strokes, as you were saying. Um, and that's, you know, these, these really harsh lines, that's kind of what I'm, you know, what I'm doing there. And then I'm stopping it, you know, a little bit when I'm putting, you know, these delicate lines in there or these hand sewn um, or, you know, crocheted um, items. And so, you know, as visual artists, I guess, you know, that's kind of a, a language that, that we, uh, that, that we know uh, and that we're familiar with. And so we, we use all of the tools that we have. But yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, and Anting Anting um, is a sculpture about, um, about uh, folklore and also about mythical uh, stories. Um, again, you know, folklore and mythical stories are really, really um, popular in the Philippines and they're passed on from, you know, from one generation to the next. Um, I remember growing up, you know, I was told so many stories about, uh, about, you know, mythical creatures, you know, or mystical, um, uh, things that are happening at night, you know, and um, even with like bananas, you know, um, you know, there, there is a story about bananas that, uh, or a banana blossom, which, um, which is kind of, you know, what this is, um, you know, that actually, uh, that actually reminded me of, uh, you know, of my childhood. And anting anting just means amulet. Um, and, you know, with my research, I also, uh, I also found out about, um, um, about how, you know, amulets and these stories actually relate to colonialism. Because, you know, the 400 years of colonization, uh, the Filipinos were, you know, were, um, they were, I mean, they fought, but they were outnumbered and they were outgunned. Um, and they also didn't have a, a strong military training. And so they relied on things like amulets to actually, you know, protect them. And this is how, um, and this is how they went to war. Um, just, you know, just thinking about the fact that, you know, well, they're, um, you know, the, the stories that they've heard from their childhood and how, you know, these amulets can actually protect them in war. Um, and so I, you know, I thought this was um, such a, such a good story to really um, inject into the research as well. And a lot of it really um, are just stories from my dad, you know, or from, um, you know, from my childhood that, you know, like I said, were passed on from one generation to the next. Um, and Batek and the Lhasa of control, again, it's kind of uh, similar with the, with the dress, uh, my mother's guest in. Um, and, you know, Batek is actually, you know, for some of you who um, aren't uh, familiar with what a Batek is, it's a, uh, it's a method of dyeing fabric using wax and it's it's such a laborious method um and i actually tried it and it took me um it took me a long time to do and um 
And, you know, I'm sure I'm going to do it again, but I don't know if that kind of have my reservations because, um, again, it's so laborious. But, um, but I wanted to do it because uh, it actually has a similar um, um, history as the um, as the parol, in that um, it is also claimed by a lot of different countries uh, in in Africa, in you know, in, in Indonesia, in um, in the Philippines, and also in uh, a lot of Pacific Islands, um, and so you know, the lineage of um, this object or this method of dyeing fabric is actually, again, it's unclear. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to uh, inject that in there and, you know, and also, you know, make it uh, more, you know, make it uh, known that um, the parole is not the only object that actually doesn't have a clear lineage. Um, in fact, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the uh, objects um, that you know that we know of can be traced to um, a lot of different you know cultures. Um, uh, in our comments, Raven, who's here, says, "I can relate to the piecing together these quote scraps unquote of where one comes from and being in between different cultures and how one culture is sort of the quote bully of the other culture." but not being able to separate the two because they are now so intertwined and mixed together in some areas feeling uneven or choppy, like in the pieces displayed, trying to find old things of the colonialized culture, many of the things that were erased or changed and giving them new life or finding a personal meaning to them and using that for art or story, or even just trying to draw attention to them is also very relatable. And I, I love that comment, Raven, but I, and I have to say, I, that's, I do hear similar um, comments from, from people, even without maybe knowing that some of the particulars that is so exciting that you do know as the artist, like that you are research-based, like that you, doing the research and you're trying to find ways to sort of visualize that using the other skills that you have and the other truths of things that you know about materials and how they hold stories. Um, and for, I think so many people, um, you know, there is this piecing together, either they're from many different cultures, um, they've, this is a new culture that they've come to, they're, recreating themselves. I mean, it's part of the community college spirit to write lots of new beginnings, but with all of that change, things can be lost, things can be misunderstood and things can just be unknown. And yeah. that can be hard, right? Like the parole, like it's like, well, yeah. I can't really tell you. I've done all the research. Yeah. And as yeah. adults, I mean, in, in our world, there's some part of us maybe accepts that, but you know, there's part of that that's really a true loss. Like you want to have some of that certainty about some of those things. Yeah. And that's a kind of legacy of colonialism that I think that many of us, you know, uh, don't, uh, haven't understood, mm -hmm. you know, haven't had to understand, but maybe we're relating it to different aspects of our own experience, you know. Exactly. Now. Yeah, and, and I love that comment so much. And also Raven's comment. Um, it's, yeah, it is, I love that so much because this is, you know, this is exactly um, what it is. And, and what you said about, uh, about lineage and authenticity, you know, sometimes we don't have a choice but to suture, you know, all the knowledge that we know, you know, or put them together, um, you know, when, uh, there is a genre actually um, in, uh, in, in writing right now, uh, in, in scholarly writing right now called uh, speculative, uh, speculative writing or speculative narrative. Because some people don't really have a choice but to you know, suture these stories together because um, they're not in the archives, they're not in, in the library, they're not in the books. And so we kind of, you know, we kind of, really have to contend with the fact that, you know, there is no direct lineage. 
And it's funny that you said that also because um, because when I had the show, uh, my thesis show at USC, I had this uh, Filipino family who came in, um, and I didn't know, you know, I didn't know them. They were just coming in from, you know, from uh, the neighborhood, you know, when and, and they were really um, they were really looking at um, the work, you know, and, and and trying to decipher it and trying to, you know, talk to me about it also. And so I told them about the parol and, and the history and how, you know, the roots are unclear. And so after explaining all of these things, one of them said, well, but where does it really come from? And I'm like, well, that's the point. We don't know, you know? And he's like, well, we have to know. And I'm like, do we, <laughs> you know? We, um, well, you know, there is a need for people to know their language and to know the roots, but sometimes we just don't know. There, it, it's not, you know, it's so murky that we kind of just have to contend with, you know, with having these uh, syncretic narratives or these syncretic cultures, you know, that it, and and I call it hybridity actually, um, because a lot of it, you know, it is just hybrid. Um, and, and, you know, and in a lot of our cultures, we actually celebrate hybridity because it's, uh, it's, to me, it's beautiful. Um, and that's just, you know, what it is now. I mean, achuete or achiote, um, you know, for, be, before this, I didn't know, um, I didn't know where it came from, you know? And so like these things are actually, they do have but you know they, but it's also beautiful that like you know they exist in other cultures as well. Um, yeah, so this is actually leaving colonial consumption is actually in um, in at Gallery Two Hundred Six as well, um, and you know and and again along the same lines of you know we're all consuming these um, you know these uh, these items like you know, or, or food like chippy, which is a corn chip that I grew up eating <laughs> all the time. And, you know, corn, where does it come from? You know, and so there's a lot of like all of these, um, uh, the, the food and the items that we, we consume that have, you know, colonial implications. Um, spam as well is, is similar to that. Um, and, you know, last but not the least, <laughs> embracing my uh, inner badoi. Badoi just means um, like lowbrow, like bad taste. I think it's um, in Mexico, it is uh, called uh, uh, rescuate. And does anyone know what that is? <laughs> rescuate? It's actually, um, so it's, um, yeah, it just means like uh, tasteless, like, having bad taste. Um, and so a lot of, a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of the times when you mix um, a lot of uh, cultural items, uh, you know, and, you know, it becomes this like um, an amalgamation of a lot of different things. Um, it becomes like, you know, people would say, you know, oh, that is, you know, important, you know, or if you're putting all of these like highly chromatic, um, highly chromatic, uh, uh, you know, items together or colors together, you know, when, um, you know, again, that is seen as you yeah, have bad taste. And so for me, I'm embracing that because it is about, um, it, this is about hybrid. And again, you know, I'm talking about contending with, um, with, you know, the fact that we may never know um, you know, our true lineage, you know, when, or the true lineage of anything. Um, and that's okay because, um, and, you know, in a way we kind of like have to embrace these things um, and just content with that. And I think I'm going to end it there. <laughs> that was really exciting. And um, I so appreciate hearing your uh, words and descriptions. Do you feel like when you think back to um, when you were more of a newcomer artist going to college and um, did you imagine making work 
like this? Was this uh, something that you thought about then? Um, or is it something you felt like you found later? Well, I actually, um, I graduated from uh, Cal State Long Beach in 2013. So when I gave myself uh, a few years to go from undergrad to grad school, um, and so I have um, done uh, some some work uh, before before I did this thesis work, and it it is uh, more about my immigrant experience. Um, but this is actually the first time that I've gone to search for this, um, and yeah, and I I love it actually. It really is it it it, it informs me. Um, and it actually um, gives so much, um, you know, so much context. And so it, it, it's, in a way, it's rich. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be research based. <laughs> you know, I'm just choosing to, you know, to, to do that and, and teaching um, history and a lot of, um, you know, and a lot of these uh, corner legacy in my work. Um, but, um, but yeah. Well, it's really, it, if anybody in the audience has any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat um, and let me know and I'll make sure that um, Diane can get them uh, so that we can respond. I love the comments that we've had so far. Yeah. As you're thinking about future projects, I know that you're, um, exhibiting quite a lot right now is this do you feel is this body of work continuing are you uh are there new things on the horizon as well or i mean you just started mining this very rich area yeah because this is uh this is thesis based work um it is it's a lot um and i'm i, I can actually take from from each piece um and expand and so that's actually what I'm doing right now, um, you know, and making it a little bit, uh, a little bit more simple, you know, and, and um, you know, and, and again, what I just talked about is so much and it, it encompasses so much. Um, but, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually working on uh, on an installation right now uh, for the city of Glendale. Um, and it's gonna be kind of like a public uh, a public installation, but I mean, it's indoors, but it's seen uh, from the outside. Um, and that also continues uh, this way. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Um... I'm just checking. I think we're covered in terms of the comments that have come in. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything that they saw today that they might want to like ask the artist? I have a million. Oh, Vivian does. Oh, Vivian's <laughs> hands up. Okay. Go ahead, Vivian. I think was, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> it was more of a comment and uh, letting you know that I really appreciate your work. I think that as colonized people, we do try to find where we come from. And it reminded me of Jessica Wimley, how Jessica Wimley had to kind of piece together her history. So she'd be doing photographs almost to try to insert her culture, insert herself into it. We try because most of our records are gone. We don't have a way to, to go back. I loved your uh, parole because we have a similar thing in Guatemala also. We use this paper, right, with the bamboo sticks and we created ourselves. And I had always, I, I never knew until I got to this country as an immigrant about Philippine culture and my papers were Philippine. And I was to always wonder why all the last names were so, you know, Gonzalez and so and all the Spanish. And it wasn't until later, you know, that I started learning way more about it. But I think colonized people and immigrants here there is that thing that we're trying to weave like when i saw your mother's duster i loved it because it really made me it transported me immediately to a freeway corner in downtown la because you have this cement things that are holding 
you have the metal that is holding this fabric, which is a duster. And it made me think of all the jobs as immigrants that we hold, you know, as a cleaning lady, a construction person, the orange, the bags of oranges. So when you're selling oranges on the corner. So that's why it made me think of that, that freeway corner. So I really love how you're stitching together this new thing, which I do think it's exciting. It is nice to know or try to figure out where we come from, but we never be able to get that ancestry or all that history back for us. But it's nice, especially here, to be able to piece together where we come from. So I really appreciate your work and I wanted to let you know that. Oh, thank you, Vivian. Yeah, I and talking to other folks um, up in the show and and also my own, you know, reveries like walking through and thinking about it, I do feel like having those items which are so specific to you and um, your cultural experience and that as often happens with artwork, I feel like that specificity somehow makes it uh, more available to people that the idiosyncratic moment, like you can at least, even if that's not something that you've experienced like a particular chip or scrap or um, you understand what that is, you can, adjust uh, relate in that way and uh, like I mentioned you know my family is from the south and mm -hmm. and so making like quilts um was a big part of that um and there's this whole thing where people like buy the fabrics and make the quilts but the quilts that meant something to us were the bits that were left from really old quilts that were made out of the parts of clothes that didn't get holes in them and that were not necessarily brightly colored because they were, you know, the clothing that was used for labor and mm -hmm. all these things. And, um, and so you sort of see the differences in that and the sort of expressionistic way mm -hmm. your things are put together and sort of covered with paint. And, um, but then, you know, when you look closely, it's like you want, oh, where's that from? And, oh yeah, I know what that is. And that looks like part of a person's clothing that's definitely from another culture right Mexican culture that's food stuff it's mm -hmm. um you start understanding this sort of putting this story together mm -hmm. and um I think for many many people that is whether they've born and raised in the same spot making sense of family stories and big gaps in them mm -hmm. um is not you know can be uh, a sort of a rhyming mm -hmm. story that seeing these strategies of how to go forward, how mm -hmm. to, you know, make something culminate out of these bits and pieces, how to make them make sense for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then how to share them with others, invite others in um, to a certain degree um, too. I think it just demonstrates a lot of possibilities in that way. Mm -hmm. And also sort of helping people relate to the, the pain, the loss, the real, um, the reality of a, you know, a colonial legacy and how that is still alive and happening now, mm -hmm. um, the results of that, even if perhaps aspects of it happened long ago, how it plays out these legacies trace forward. And I think there's, you know, power in that too. Um, I think for those that it resonates with and then also as a illustration for those who are clueless, right? So it's, it's really something. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. By the way, did you use the powder achote or the one that comes like a paste? Um, no, I actually bought a not, the, a not of the actual seeds. <laughs> oh, you bought more apple seeds. Wow. Oh my gosh, yeah. I bought this big um this big thing. It's a I think it's a gallon of annatto seeds. Um, because I, I just had a few and I'm like, like this is not gonna be enough. And so even a gallon, you know, of that wasn't really turning it into this bright red that I wanted it to be. Um, and of course, because what you know, when you're dying with with food um it fades it doesn't actually you know it doesn't actually um remain um you know saturated so um 
you know, a lot of times we just have to keep dying it. Um, but, you know, I kind of like how, you know, it, it is fading now, but I still wanted, you know, at the time I really wanted that bright red. <laughs> and that's why, yeah, you know, and so the annatto seeds, um, they were actual seeds that I had to pulverize, um, you know, and, and it was taking so long to pulverize them. And then I put them in a, I created a paste and put up, you know, to create the paste, I had to put them in a mixer, you know, and, um, and a lot of it was still not being pulverized because the only the actual outside part has that, um, has that red. And so I actually broke my mixer because the seed oh, is no. so hard. Yeah. And so, <laughs> but, um, but if anyone is interested in dying with, um, with food, um, turmeric is actually, or turmeric is actually a great dying, um, you know, material. Um, and I, I've actually used that as well. And it gives you this golden uh, yellow uh, color. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic tips. Yeah, I would imagine it would be a beautiful color. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Diane. I'm going to wrap it thank up now. You. I know people are moving to their next classes. and But thank you for sharing your work with us and sharing your time today and all of your research. This is just fascinating and um, just goes to support uh, ever, uh, your amazing objects that are with us until December. Um, so I hope Folks, even if you're learning remotely, come on to campus Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, we have the gallery open, the second floor of the library, um, but you could always call Vivian or I here at the um, gallery in Mintry Hall, and we can make an appointment to open it for you. So um, don't be shy. Come see the show while we have the great opportunity of having the work here. But Diane Williams, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay.